Welcome to our new live stream cast with Christopher Bramley right here for the Circle community. Uh, Christopher Bramley is one of our fantastic guides who works in the community. He's also a well-known TED speaker. He's the director and principal of Finding Shores, and he's doing some great work. And he's, he's taken some time out of his schedule today to come and spend some time with us and just let us know how RAF's being used uh, across the universe, so to speak. I'm expanding for you there, Christopher. So, <laughs> But without much uh, more ado, instead of listening to me, let's talk to Chris Bramley. Thanks, Tony. So, um, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey with RAF from the uh, the discovery. Um, actually put on to um, all of you by Ian Phillips, who said this stuff's really interesting. And I was, I was investigating what somebody else had termed a remote working manifesto, which seemed a little extreme. Um, and that stuff that uh, you were all pulling together, and it, it just made a lot of sense. And also, you've done it before me. So I stopped bothering what I was doing and started looking at what you were doing, which made a lot more sense. Um, and I think that the value for me has really come from the multitude of ways that you can use kind of the ideas, the concepts and the canvases. And I think the canvases, I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting to see them differently to how I saw them before. I, I, I tend to talk about them more in terms of a kind of living document, you know, instead of a instead of a playbook that you might traditionally create for a client and say, you know, here's your thing. There's a problem with playbooks, of course, is that number one, they never get looked at again. Or number two, they get followed to the letter and essentially ossify and embed in the company. And then you just get people following stuff by rote, which either isn't fit for purpose or over time stops being fit for purpose. So what I like about these kind of canvases is you can actually use them as vectors over time by looking at what teams have done before, looking at what they've done now, charting the difference between the two. So you can use them for analysis. You can use them for um, you know, launching teams, you can use them for exploration, you can use them in a modular way. Um, and I've just found them really, really useful for all different possible kind of archetypes and, and, and methodologies. So, you know, traditionally, we'd be looking at this in terms of um, <clears throat> what can we use in, in agile? And how can we use this specifically in product? And of course, very few companies only operate in, in agile ways and in product. So, um, having the ability to have a canvas that can actually fit the context of a team that um, is working in an operational fashion or is providing a service or, or is solving a complex problem as a digital product or is a mission-based team that's trying to enable other teams to work properly or whatever it is, or interface with leadership teams. And I use the word teams relatively loosely there because it's usually more a bunch of individuals heading in the same direction some of the time. Um, <clears throat> and not all the time. So having the ability to kind of plot that out on, on the canvases and, and kind of use them in, in interesting and new ways, which um, I think John has said several times, I tend to use them in interesting and new ways, is really, is really important. Now, for me, one of the added benefits is the fact that, you know, being autistic and having neurodiversity, which I was probably going to mention sooner or later, means that I tend to see things it's like the old uh, big trouble in little China thing. I see things no one else can see, do things no one else can do. That comes with some caveats and kryptonite, but having the ability to plot different things and use these canvases in ways that they might not have been intended, but very successfully makes them very flexible. So in actual fact, I don't, I don't use that many other canvases these days simply because why reinvent the wheel when you've already got this stuff there. So, you know, I, I, I love kind of using them. And a lot of what I use them for now is kind of exploring the operating model of, of businesses and looking at full transformations, um, very often cultural. So, you know, I've, I've mentioned this to a, a number of people before. We focus way too much on ways of working in what we do. Um, we, we all know the, the quote, you know, um, strategy, it's uh, nope, sorry. It's uh, culture. It's strategy for breakfast. You know, we we know that quote, <clears throat> but we don't really think about it in terms of what we're doing in a company. We talk about still policies, and we talk about what we're going to be doing, and who's going to be in charge of what, and roles and responsibilities, and 
the greater part of a transformation has to be cultural because if you just put ways of working in, you can use these canvases for ways of working. You can agree to stuff, but if you can't inspire and, and incentivize or and or incentivize people within teams and at leadership level to all get on board and, and do this kind of I'm going to upset Dave Snowden if he sees this holistically, right? Moving at multiple levels at once, moving in tandem across all of this. Um, then eventually those get gamed by people who are used to different models of legitimacy. They're used to different ways of doing things. They prefer their default patterns and they'll find a way to game what they're doing and they'll fall back into those patterns, which means whatever you, you had um, that's innovative just doesn't sustain. So <clears throat> kind of with that in mind, I'll, I'll go through a few bits and pieces. I mean, did you want to ask me anything there, Tony? Or No, I think, Chris, I think uh, for me, Chris, the one thing people would be really interested in um, in understanding your journey to this is uh, how well it's been accepted by the people that you're actually using this with. Yeah, so I'd say that it's been largely overwhelmingly positive. Um, you will always get differences in people not necessarily liking colour schemes. There's always going to be the kind of accessibility side of it where colour blindness can play a part, especially with a lot of primary colours. Um, but by and large, having something that's quite bright, quite focal and quite accessible to a number of people has been very well received, including some of the things that you wouldn't necessarily consider to be you know, so business focused. So, for example, the story me or story us canvas um, where a lot of people you know will say well what, what's the point of this I mean can we get on with just working out how we're going to work and actually using those as an icebreaker I think is really important um, because number one it's an applicable icebreaker it's not just some random game that you've thought up but it also gets people relaxed and seeing each other as people which is a really really important precursor to getting them to see other teams as groups of people rather than blockers and impediments and you know teams that are just going to stop them doing what they need to do once you can start working on that basis you can start collaborating with people within teams rather than coming up against teams that just aren't working for you and of course then you start going into all the dependencies that may exist and and all that kind of thing but yeah they, they've been very well received in a number of organizations um, <clears throat> from startups through to large banks through to current, you know, some government contracts that I'm working on. Um, they just they just make sense and they're relatively simple. I think the biggest difficulty is getting people to accept that you don't have to sit down and go through every piece of all of them in sequence, um, which is often one of the fears. So, and you don't, which is good. <clears throat> so, um, with that in mind, I can probably yes. move on. I can actually get my... Oh, here we go. So <clears throat> when we're talking about why we'd, we would use these canvases, uh, this is part of a presentation I often give to um, leadership teams and, and, crucially, middle management. I think one of the most important things with this kind of approach is to actually, you know, we talk about um, getting leadership buy-in, and we always talk about we've got to drive cultural adoption and agility and whatever from leadership down. So we need their buy-in. I agree, but I think that's a very small piece of the puzzle. You actually need leadership live-in as well, right? So if leadership aren't the leadership who are part of the system, that they want to adopt these new understandings, concepts, cultures, way of ways of working, if as part of the system, they don't also adopt them, there's going to be an issue and a mismatch um, and, and, you know, possible um power struggle paradigms that, that happen and so forth so leadership do drive it but culture is interesting when leadership drive it that's quite an innovative approach you're trying to innovate differences and in novel practices for example within your your company or novel culture or, or whatever it is <clears throat> um but culture and, and the way that you kind of underpin this disseminates from the interactions between people and teams so I find it quite interesting that it's an innovative drive, but it's a disruptive um, dissemination. So you've got this kind of double, you know, up and up and down effect. But all of this is defined, and this is the key part, 
by the actions and inactions of leaders. And so the, the inactions is an important part because there you've got your kind of um, your, your dark constraints, if you like, within the system. People see that within teams. Now that ties into things like models of legitimacy, which tie straight into middle management, which is the middle strata. If you don't change what makes people feel legitimate and you don't help visualize this stuff and you don't help them you know, surface these issues for everyone to see and, and help them be psychologically safe to move forward and start adopting these things, show them the benefits of it, people will not change. I mean, if I was rewarding you for a type of behavior and then said, we're going to do something else and continue rewarding you for the old type, why would you do anything different, right? So <clears throat> it, it's important to kind of reframe this for leadership and say, look, you know, you shouldn't be making all these decisions, really. You should be allowing teams to do it. Let's let the teams explore how to do it. Free you up to make the strategic decision making you should be doing. Free you up to coordinate things properly. Leaders are humans too. Middle management are humans too. Um, there's immense pressure to have all the answers for everything for a lot of people in management and leadership. So this, again, I'm going to use the word holistic approach across everything to try and help um, kind of bring everyone into step. I, I don't like just going in and changing one team with all of these things. So I like to use a lot of these canvases kind of in um, <clears throat> in tandem with, with different teams at different levels. So I don't just go in and coach a team. I coach at an executive level. I coach middle management. I coach key influencers. I identify stakeholders. I act as a communications device um, and kind of matcher. Um, and I, I try to pour oil on the troubled waters as much as I possibly can. So one of the reasons I love these canvases is because collaboration is one of the main things that they enable. Um, we talk about alignment a lot in business. Um, alignment can be problematic. It can be coerced. It can be demanded. The Nazis were aligned. That wasn't a particularly good point in human history, right? So collaboration is a little bit different. Collaboration requires the investment of everyone who um, is interested in the outcome of whatever you're, you're trying to produce. So if you want people to collaborate, they've got to be invested. So co-creating stuff, and that's one of the, the biggest strengths of all these canvases. If you co-create this with your clients, if you co-create this with leadership and with people, they have created this stuff. And if you're doing your job as you should be, which isn't there to farm money, but actually to sustainably help this stuff and make a real difference, once they've co-created it, they are very likely to then use it, take it, evolve it, and eventually in the fullness of time, where you fade into the background, they will keep doing so. <clears throat> so I think that's a, a really important part. If you don't co-create it, if you inflict it, people will game that system that you have forced on them, sometimes very, very quickly. So they're great living documents. You can always go back in and augment them. You can go and run new versions of them. They also help with this clarity of intent. So I tie these a lot into a lot of my work with intent-based leadership, which is obviously David Marquet's amazing work. Um, so, you know, understanding the intent at the top so that everyone knows why. What's the why of what they're doing? What are they part of? Are they a part, not a part, right? So it looks better written down when I say, <clears throat> when I have that, but when I say it, it doesn't sound so good. So, you know, the, these allow, they surface a lot of issues and they allow this really transparent communication and in some cases vulnerability now that can be problematic if people are, are feeling you know very protective of themselves i had it today actually i ran a story me two of the people didn't want to speak about any of the stuff they put down and that's perfectly fine right but we want to engender this openness so that people see each other as, as other people and they can work together more effectively so this should be fairly familiar I've co-opted this slightly, but it should be fairly familiar for people who understand the, the results pyramid. Almost all transformations work above the line. So we're looking at management, which is quite fragile, right? The roles, the responsibilities, policies, rules, official hierarchies, the processes and ways of working, the things we can manage, systems and structures defined by actions to give us results, which hopefully push us towards whatever outcome we're, we're aiming for. But those actions, you can only sustain those for a certain length of time if people don't actually believe in the things they're taking, right? So if you're forcing them to do something they fundamentally disagree with, 
that's where they'll start gaming it. So really, when we're talking about leadership, there's a distinction between that and management, often conflated, where leadership is required for culture and people, right? So the, the rituals, the behaviors, the heuristics, the habits, the stories, the connections between people, what experiences do the people in that org have, which give them beliefs, which then actually truly drive their actions long term, which give the results that will come from those, right? So that's why a lot of companies see the wrong results because they're giving actions to get a certain set of results, but the innate beliefs that people have are different. So the actions will shift and they will get different results from what they expect. So a lot of what I use these canvases for is exploring what's below the line, essentially. Does, does all that make sense? Indeed it does. And I like I like that the, the fact that you're delineating that line because it's big, it's the below the line stuff that, that a lot of people don't think about when they are looking at how you change this this management leadership paradigm so yeah really mm. that, Chris. it's it it's an, it's an interesting thing to think about like you, you need those fundamental foundational aspects of culture if you want ways of working to sustain you can always try scrum but if it's not fit for purpose and people don't like it and you know they don't really understand it they keep using it for long um you know so Having those fundamental aspects, I think, is, is really, really important. So I've drawn up um, what I like to use instead of organizational hierarchies and, 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 and structures. Um, realistically, this is kind of my representation in, in my head of what an organization really looks like. Right. So if you take something like uh, some uh, departments within government or, or, or civil services or whatever, we talk about heavy bureaucracy, and indeed they do have heavy bureaucracy, but most of them run actually based on political capital, right? So when you think about how decisions are made from ministers, from the prime minister, all the way down through to people on the ground in the teams kind of trying to do work to build products, so all of it runs on political capital. We all know that the biggest decisions don't get made in the boardroom, they get made over lunch, they get made on a golf course, they get made over a beer, they get made when you're chatting, <clears throat> so you've got that informal communication aspect that, that gets talked about quite a lot with um, with Kinevin and complex systems, which is really important. Your, your organization is built um, by a web work of the stories and connections of the people, right? If you took all of the people out of any given organization and just dumped a load of other people back in with skills, you still wouldn't have that organization back, right? They wouldn't have the context, the culture, those connections that they built up over time, the understanding. <clears throat> so then you extrapolate that out to the stories and connections of the teams themselves. So that's where you, you make sure you've launched the teams correctly and you've got the leadership kind of um, with the same direction. The way, the way you've probably heard me say it before, but the way I like to describe it is, you know, we love maps. We love knowing where we are. The problem is the landscape changes and it changes quicker and quicker and quicker. The landscape has changed or it's new a map is pointless so you think you're here and you think you can get to here via this path well what if the landscape's changed what if you're not even here anymore right following that path isn't going to get you to where you think you you need to go so actually the idea of having a compass but not having a compass held by the ceo giving everyone their own compass because they're all slightly different so their true north will be very slightly different and contextual let them all take those pathways together. That's the whole thing about the navigating and the finding shores that I, I kind of quite like to, to use as, as a visual analogy. So we've got the leadership there. We've got the team of teams, which obviously is, is a, a large part of what RAF does as well. And then I love to run that strategic leadership map. I think you've seen output from some of it before where I've run it. Um, and we decompose why the leaders are doing it. And I sometimes combine it with one of the working agreements from one of the other canvases and then say, so what, what charter are we going to agree to and hold each other accountable to as leaders so that we can then move forward um, with, and, and, and communicate the correct intent to the teams themselves? But all of that is bound within the interactions and dependencies. And realistically, that's the operating model that you run under kind of in the company. And that may change, shift or be redesigned over time. I got a question for you, um, John. Sure. You got a question for Chris? Um, what's What's your thought process when you're, um, you know, playing Lego with the canvases and 
sort of putting different things together with them? Like, how, how do you approach that? The first thing that I do is gain as much context about the teams and the scenario as I can. So, for example, if I know that a team pretty much knows what they're doing and they know each other pretty well and they're, they're operating in a pretty good way, but they're just trying to understand why they can't get their work done, I will start looking at maybe visualizing the work and saying, who's making your decisions? So I'll take like and I'll show it in, in a bit because I've got it on here, but the, the team canvas, for example, the team launch canvas, I would maybe just not do the middle part and say, right, where, where do you get your work from? Who makes the decisions? Is anything blocking you inside or outside the team? By the way, how are you being measured? And is that right? Let's have a look at these things and start trying to work out what we're doing. So it really, my favorite, one of my favorite phrases, it depends on the context. You knew that was going to drop in sooner or later. <laughs> and, but, but it really does depend on the unique context of the team and the organization. Um, so I will pop something into a mirror or mural usually, and I will just find the shade of yellow and blank parts out or, or cut pieces out or, or however I, I choose to do it. Um, so it, it really depends on what I think the outcome is going to be or whether I'm just using it for analysis and exploration, right? So for example, if I use a canvas for analysis and I say, where are you now? So instead of using the future perspective, I've actually sometimes just used the launch canvas and said, tell me how your behaviors are now. Tell me what your purpose is currently. Tell me, so we're not trying to launch, we're trying to find out the, the problems that we, we've got. So we can actually, you know, define your problem so you can actually start working out what you can do to mitigate that rather than just randomly picking something to try and fix everything, <coughs> random framework, all of that kind of stuff, right? So if that's the case, then very often on the second iteration where we, we look at launching the team, I maybe won't bother mapping the channels of communication because we know what they are and we've already decided what we're going to remove from those or, or replace or, or whatever. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, brilliant. Cool. You notice, um, by the way, all hands planning is in there in uh, italics. Um, this was something I think it was you and I, John, that we were chatting about this a while ago. But technically, if you can get your operating model design right and, and get everyone kind of moving in the same direction, with any luck, you don't need to do massive all hands planning sessions. Uh, but that's something that often gets lost in the translation because, you know, everyone starts going on about uh, PIP and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they're not necessities. They're there to um, support. And, and it's kind of like Goodhart's law. We start focusing on it. That's not the, the exact definition, but we start focusing on the metrics, the measures, the things that we can look at and visualize and whatever else, rather than the outcomes that they're there to um, to support. And I've got future perspectives kind of lurking there because they're quite useful to dip in and out of. So as I mentioned, you know, having these interactive canvases helps you explore and, and kind of look through bits and pieces. But the why is really important. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Why are you doing these things? And how can we explore what's going to best suit the paradigm rather than randomly picking whatever? And the beauty of these canvases for me is that you don't sit there and do these things the same way every time as you would when you read a playbook from one through to <clears throat> through to whatever. So a lot of these canvases can be used for some of the mapping that I do. Not all of them can. Um, you know, for example, value chains and visibility, I'll probably be using something like Wardley mapping. Um, affordances is more of a kind of feel it out and find what, what you define the environment and try and work out what is being made available to people within it. Experiences would be more something like sense making um, from Kinevin, but typically I will try to work left to right here. So I look at the counterfactuals. What isn't possible in terms of time, energy, and cost expenditure? Forget all that. We can't do it. So just draw a line under it. My sister would say, build a bridge and get over it. We'll deal with that another time, right? Let's map the constraints that we have if indeed we know what they are. What are the decisions? How many levels of intermediation? What are the dependencies? Where are you keeping your knowledge? Is it duplicated? Who looks after it? How do you curate it? What's your utilization and capacity in your teams for the love of God? You know, all of these kind of things are really important. And a lot of these you can map out or, or support using a lot of the RAF canvases, which I think is really, really useful. 
this is yours. I've totally stolen it. Um, uh, and I, but I use this a lot because I think it's really, really important to, it, it's very easy to get lost in our oh, product team and component team and service team and platform team and all of these kind of things. Now they can mean different things to different orgs. Realistically, you can break most teams down into three archetypes or hybrids of archetypes. Are you doing innovative or creative exploratory work? Are you trying to find something out that's really just unknown, right? Are you trying to sandbox things? Are you trying to enable other teams? What are you trying to do? Is it persistent or non-persistent? Are you trying to solve a complex problem and bring it through a liminal domain into a more predictable, repeatable, complicated um, methodology, right? So a lot of that, obviously, product and, 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 and software and so forth. Operations, you know, is this procedural? Do you need high fidelity input for high fidelity output that is repeatable, right? So what, what kind of team do you have? And let's give some love to the mission and operations teams because most of the time when people talk about product, that's all they talk about. I see huge amounts of fear induced in organizations who say, but we, we can't operate as product. What happens to our work in flight? What? It's okay. If you are an operations team, I'm not gonna ask you to become a product team, right? I'm gonna ask you to look at what you could do better in your work, in your context. All of these have to be managed differently. And I think that's a really, really important point that, that often gets lost in translation. <clears throat> and then of course, we've got your launch cycles. Um, can't remember if this is how you did it or not. I think it might be. Uh, anyway. You've got the, the launch where you try to clarify the, the purpose and, and make sure that they've kind of set off on the right foot. And this is how I like to think of a journey. People often say, well, a journey begins with a, a single step. And, you know, the first step is knowing this. And I'm like, that's wonderful. And it's correct. However, a journey is predicated on the fact that you keep taking steps. Right. So you need to keep going. And that's where you have the planning cycle, the review, the reflection on what you've done. Let's work through this. It doesn't have to be in sprints. It doesn't have to be in any particular methodology, just continually learning. There's a kind of Kaizen element to this, which I, I really like. And Kaizen is very important to me. I very much distinguish it from continuous improvement. Um, so that's fairly standard RAF stuff. And then of course, we've got these human canvases and people have probably seen these before. I'm gonna go through them anyway. Before, um, you, do, before you do, I think um, Luke, sure. Luke's got a, a question or a statement yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, my dog's just decided to start barking. But um, no, I was just kind of resonating with the um, co-creation co-creation part of what you were saying um, <laughs> and also the ownership and re revisiting of the canvases. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I was just talking to John and Blaney about was putting into the team's operational cadence um, an actual meeting to go back and review this, um, these canvases um, with an owner, like a product owner or a scrum master, for example. Sorry about the dog. That's all right. Uh, looks like the, the dogs are even enjoying your presentation, Chris. You can't ask for more. I can't. I can't at all. Exactly. No, no I, I think that's, I think <clears throat> that's right, though. Having, building that in, in fact, one of the things that I like to build in, I've, I've played a lot with the idea of campfires recently, so this is the informal side of things. So the formal side is the kind of communication and you can almost use those um, building in that kind of review um, with, you know, the, the, the team, maybe a product owner or whatever, coming back in and looking at that. You can almost build that in as a formal communication, which should hopefully replace other meetings you actually don't need to do so you can get on with actually doing some of the work. Um, and, and alongside that, uh, and this is a cultural piece, um, I tend to set up campfire sessions, which are usually just drop-in sessions without any theme, any agenda, any facilitation per se. Um, they are for people to reconnect as humans, come along and chat. The, the, the level of discussion and, and problem resolution and, and sharing in and between teams that happens in those sessions is far beyond what I find in any of the formalized sessions. Um, even for something like the, the RAF canvases, there's a certain ritualized element to them, um, which doesn't really exist when you just turn up with a you know virtual mug of cocoa um, and sit down and go, God, today was hard. And somebody else says, well, how come? And you talk about bits and then you say your dog won't stop barking. And then someone else says, yeah, me too. I found something that sorts that. And by the way, how did you get around this issue with 
and people say, well, we did it like this. And although you can't emulate success because it's highly contextual, um, you can learn from it and you can learn from the failures, which are usually less contextual. So th these informal elements are really important as well. And, and actually, the, the, the story me is, is a lovely informal part. This is what I, I use as an icebreaker. So I, I, don't, I don't always do it in a specific order, but if I do do it in an order, I will usually run a story me with people as an icebreaker. I will then run through some of the team launch stuff. And then afterwards, I'll maybe run a team, uh, a story us, so that the team starts saying, well, this is who we are, right? As opposed to who I am, this is who we are. But another thing that I like to do is take a couple of teams in breakouts running their own story me's. And then you come to one story us canvas and you say, why don't you tell us who you are as a team? Give them a bit of time to talk about it first so they kind of get it set. But um, who are you? So you get two teams. Why are we a team? So you get the team response and the team response on one canvas. It's quite it's quite an interesting way. I don't know. That's probably not how it was designed to be used, Tony. But you know me. Uh, yeah, basically whatever works. So it's, it's interesting that you you, you approach it that way because I approach it in exactly the same way as as uh, oh, wow the guys here will know. That's particularly how I use those as well, and have used those with with organisations that I've been working with. So kudos. Great, great minds yeah. think alike, and so do we. Which so. could be very scary, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would so, love to use something like that. Yeah. <laughs> we then talk about. We then talk about some of the, you know, the team canvases. I mean, obviously, I don't need to go into detail of these. These are your canvases, but but mapping these, I usually start in the middle and then kind of move. It depends. I sometimes go to the the, the channels of communication and then I'll move over to the left. But it, it really it, it depends. If I'm honest, what I use least on this is probably organizational policies as part of this. Um, I, I think that the, the the measures, supports, and constraints usually tend to cover some of those things because the policies tend to be constraints. But um, but I find these really good. And if you've got those remote team events or team events, <clears throat> I tend to you know to, to use that as a separate canvas anyway. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, and I think is really important, is that um, everything here is called remote. Uh, but you know, Tony and John will know that I talk about distributed and work from anywhere. I've used these canvases in person. So yep. I've modified them, make them larger and had people use post-its and they are very, very capable for that as well. So you should be able to, if you set it up and use everything right, let's not talk about the turf war of hybrid, which is poorly understood. Um, people tend to use remote as a substitute for being in person as opposed to using it with the strengths of the paradigm, right? So using these as, as in-person canvases works really well. You can use them um, distributed as well. And I love that because you can slap this on a wall or wherever and say, if any if anyone in the team pulls out, it doesn't do stuff properly or pulls out or whatever, you can point to this and say, we agreed this. And you can start holding each other accountable. I think that's a really important point. A lot of teams flail as individuals trying to meet individual tasks rather than holding themselves accountable as a team to get those tasks done as a team, where you've then got the possibility of upskilling skills, liquidity and whatever within the team, right? So I find that a, a, a kind of much, much better way to approach it. Um, and that's, by the way, that, that's what I also use on the, on the leadership canvas sometimes on the strategic composition to kind of get the agreement for how they should be leading going forward, which is interesting. And of course, you can then expand that to how all the teams are going to work together and what cadences they'll run under. I don't use the launch plan very often. I think I'm starting to develop an allergy to Gantt chart style things. But um, it is important to get it's important to get these kind of waves and having weeks is fine. I think if you look at it in terms of big steps, ironically, a lot of these transformations, which are to remove project ideas, are presented in a project way. Um, it's a bit of an irony. Again, going back to the marine kind of analogies, rather than a big wave of change, I prefer to think of it as a tide lapping up the shore and you actually don't notice that each wave is slightly higher. Uh, the best journeys are the ones that you don't really realise you're on until you get to a point and you look back and you say, well, oh, goodness, because then there's no resistance to the change, there's no fear for it. 
you're actually experiencing the journey rather than thinking about the journey that you've got to take, which is a, a kind of less useful use of your time. And of course, we then get the interactions and dependencies. Now, this is a really, really useful canvas and I've, I've added to it, but then I've left all the text in dark black, which means you can't read it. So the color coded parts uh, show which teams you're for. And the, the part in the middle with the arrow pointing towards it says space between the teams if you can't read it. And I think that that's a, a really nice way of thinking about it, right? So there's a space between us. There's a space between the teams. And very often those teams see each other as fundamental blockers to success of the, their own team because they're not seen as people. But you also don't see the other dependencies the team might have, the other constraints the team might have. So it's understanding that it's actually quite complex and there's stuff hidden this helps surface it, and then you can either put in dependencies you should have, or more usually, remove the dependencies you just don't need, right, which are inducing cost of delay and all that kind of stuff. So that this, along with um, that mapping the decisions and removing all the decisions you don't need, i.e. giving agency and decision-making authority to the teams, a la, you know, intent-based leadership, they're two of the, the best things that I've found work within an organization for for true like systemic change. <clears throat> and then we've got the leadership canvas. I must admit, I preferred this when it was more purple, um, but that was just my personal preference. So this is really interesting. Now, on the story me, I find that the most difficult thing for people to answer, the most vulnerable is identify me. People are not used to publicly talking about their actual identity, especially, um, you know, People past certain ages who are used to having a specific work and personal split, right, of their identity. So they have a work persona and a home persona. Um, younger generations don't tend to have that so much with the advent of social media and one personal brand. People tend to have a persona across a, a little more. Um, but, but splitting that out is, is interesting because there's a vulnerability there that a lot of people aren't equipped to, to deal with necessarily. And again, on this, we find that vulnerability as well. So we look at, I, I always start kind of top right and, and work round. We look at the clarity, competence and care for how we lead our teams. You know, it's a, it's a nice, safe place to start. I'm a leader and I think of it like this. Well, how do you lead the systems? And realistically, for me, that's managing our systems. But, you know, how do, how do we manage and, and lead kind of those elements? Now, how do we work together? That's a little bit trickier, uh, especially for quite senior leadership who are used to, making independent decisions. How do we lead ourselves? This is a core part for me. Do we allow challenge to our internal decision-making models? Are we allowed to be human? How can we work into this? You know, do we, do we take criticism well? All of these kind of things, that's very vulnerable for leaders. So I always start on the top right and work my way around because it kind of relaxes them into this a little bit. And then of course we've got um, the, the analysis or the analysis and launch if, if you like of this where you it, it's very similar to the team one but you're looking at slightly different ways of looking at the measures and and actually kind of i like the lifting our eyes analogy because if you want to be successful you have to look at two resolutions you have to be able to see the detail but you have to be able to scan the horizon as well and it people find it very hard to dial back in and out right obviously as a coach you, you learn to do that it's very hard for leadership to, to do that with all the demands on their time, which is precisely why they should be letting go of all those decisions they don't need so they can focus on these kind of things, which are more important. Right? And then, of course, this is one of my favorite ones. I love this. And I, in fact, a, a very effective way of getting elements of an organization that don't like each other and aren't working well together to start working better. Very often, they all have surprisingly similar intent. And they very often have surprisingly similar language and, and ways of kind of wanting to start approaching things. What they don't have or what they feel they don't have is a voice compared to the others. So if you can bring people together and, and even just do a, a kind of proto operating model using this, what you can, you know, you might not use it, but what you're doing is giving everyone an equal voice in, and you're helping them build it together. You can actually take a step back and let them just build something where they can say, we can kind of see how this will work. And that starts giving this kind of impetus to working as a, as a collaborative collective rather than a bunch of warring factions, which is a quite 
quite the feudal traditional way of looking at things. So um, I, just in the, in the spirit of time, Chris, um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> we've got about five minutes. Pretty much done, I think. Yeah. About five minutes left to go, yeah. It's just a, yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Thank no, 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 I'm, I'm pretty much done anyway. Here's the beautiful all hands planning, which I try not to use as often as possible, because if you set your operating model up well, hopefully you don't have to use this, but this is really useful to start exploring things if you are in flight um, or you need to kind of, you know, pull everyone together to, to kind of set off from, from the same place. So that's kind of how I think about and use your, your main set of canvases. There's actually a Wardley map on the end of this, but I'm sure you won't mind if that pops up. Um, I love, I told you I like to use these separately. What I like about this is the starting at purpose and moving clockwise. Why are you doing this? Who is it for? How are you going to make sure it's it's going to work? What are the outcomes that make it successful? How should it run during the session? And I love the fact that tooling is last. You shouldn't be building stuff around tooling. The tooling should be there to support what you do. And you should have a tool kit. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. There's no point in get also having a screwdriver and using it like a hammer. You've actually got to know how to use all these tools applicably and appropriately um, to, to support what you're trying to achieve. And then, of course, good old future perspective. I remember this fondly when we were working on it. Um, <clears throat> what I like about this is the fact that you're saying, here's where we are. Here's how things are going to be bad if we don't change or, or what might happen if we do change or whatever. Here's our utopia where we want to get to, usually within a time frame. I mean, people tend to pick six months quite a lot for that. Now, where do we plausibly think we can get to from where we are now to a future state we probably can't get to? I mean, that's how I tend to, to work through it. And in fact, I think that's the approach that's written down there, actually. So uh, it's probably quite useful. But but the future perspective I find quite, quite useful um, in terms of exploring where you are now. I think for, for a more holistic view, the future perspective is really good for a, a kind of more work focused view and working on kind of where you are now as an analysis of team campus is probably more appropriate. And good old Wardy maps, if you want to know where your chains are and what this is going to serve you, do some Wardy mapping as well. So that hopefully gives you a bit of an overview of, of how I, I tend to use some of these canvases. Um, there is no hard and fast rule. I work partially by feeling, um, partially by logic, and partially by feedback. Right. So um, that's that's how I use it. And it's it's been used very successfully in a number of different areas. People really like the canvases and they just make sense. The key to it is that you need to understand enough about the facilitation and what they stand for to use them effectively. So if you just give someone a canvas, that's not a recipe for success. And I think that's a really important thing to, to understand. The value lies in understanding them and what you do. So anyway, I feel like I've talked way too much now, Toby. Uh, uh, so. That was fantastic, Chris. So we really enjoyed it. In fact, I wish we had more time. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the reality of that. So oh, applause for him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Come and caught you there in the background. <laughs>